Good morning, everyone. You are listening to 99 on the Line here on WBCR Radio. Sorry for the wait if you were waiting on this time. Had some technical difficulties, and we got all that fixed up thanks to the vice president of WBCR, Nyla. So thank you, Nyla, for helping me out. Um, starting off with sports, as usual, I'm going to be talking about the Giants and the Jets um, games this past week and this past weekend. Also talk about DeGrom with the Mets and how he finished strong to make his case for the National League Cy Young Award. And I'm also, I want to talk about um, David Wright returning and some information about him and what his plans for the future is going to be. Also talk about some Yankees and talk about the NBA season that's right around the corner. The NBA starts in October 16th, so it's right around the corner. But I'll start with the New York football Giants and talking about how they got the Giants got a much needed win on their ro- on the road against the Texans this past Sunday they played at 1 p.m. Eastern time and they won the game 27 to 22 and it is and it was their first win of the season so the first thing i want to talk about before i get to any of the stat lines or anything t- before i get to any of the stat lines is the offensive line the offensive line has been the main topic of this New York Football Giants team for the past few a couple years in terms of how well the offense plays and they did their job this week this last week they did their job against um jj watt one of the most prolific defensive ends and pass rushes the game has ever seen and he looked back to form he returned from a broken leg that he suffered from last year and he, even though he got three sacks on chad willer the new starting right tackle chad willer seems to be well at least in this one game i know it's just a small sample size chad wheeler looked way much better than eric flowers who originally is is naturally a left tackle excuse me and because of his poor performances from the last couple seasons he was a first round draft pick in the 2015 nfl draft by the giants and he just not has lived up to the potential that they believed that he had and that he did have he looked like a promising offensive tackle coming out of college i believe it was miami that he that he went to in college but it hasn't worked out and the the new york giants head coach pat Shermer decided to the 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 new york giants head coach pat Shermer decided to um make the change eric flowers um got benched last week and according to pat Shermer, he took it just like any nfl player he just said okay coach you know the usual things that players say um, usually players want to be on the field, but Eric Flowers, I believe, understands the reason why he was benched, and he has to play better. It's, it gets no simpler than that. You have to play better. And with Chad Willer on the field, the Giants' offensive line looked way much better. Also with the new center, now that um, the Giants' starting center, John Jalapio, he suffered, I believe, a broken ankle a week ago, so he's out for the season. And John Greco, he started at center. He looked pretty good and was solid and was finishing off blocks as head coach Pat Sherman was staying in the the postseason so if the Giants offensive line can continue to 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 push the way they're to to, to hold up like the way they did against the a Houston Texas defense that's not great but it's a solid defense especially with J.J. Watt back and he just him alone is a great uh piece a, a great assignment you have to worry about if you're the Giants offensive line and they did well and it led to uh, an explosive offensive game by the Giants they scored 27 points and in the previous two games of the of the season the Giants only scored 28 points and we're talking about a team that has Saquon Barkley at running back Odell Beckham Jr. wide receiver Sterling Shepard in the slide wide receiver and Evan Ingram who I'll discuss in a moment he got hurt and it, it's a little bit concerning but you have all these offensive weapons and you finally get to see it, it come to fruition with all the pieces coming together now that the offensive line had a solid game. And hopefully they can keep it up. Um, Eli Manning had way more time and he was able to complete 25 of his 29 passes. So he had a great, accurate day on um, this past Sunday. He completed 86% of his passes. And that's the second highest complete percentage in a single game he's ever had in his career. So that goes to show you that Eli Manning, even though he has a lot of these flashes and Eli has never been a great quarterback, he has the instances where he makes these boneheaded throws and interceptions and he's known for taking a lot of risks. 
but he's shown that he could still get it get the job done when he has some time on the offensive line gives him the time so he completed 80 86 percent of his passes he threw for 297 yards including two touchdown passes no interceptions he was f- sacked four times and again jj watt had three sacks but for the most part this giants offense looked really 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 good and lived up to the expectation that people including myself and a lot of giants fans had before the season started um also some stats to know is saquon barkley he had 82 yards on 17 rushes that's a 4.8 average so he nearly averaged five runs and if you watch the game you can see that the offensive line was giving him holes to run through and when he had a little just even sometimes a little space to get through he's so explosive and fast that he was able to to explode out of the hole and get those 10 yard runs and he looked really good he also had five receptions for 35 yards. So total purposes, total purpose yards, he had 117, which is really, really good. And among the uh, elite stats um, of NFL running backs, Odell Beckham Jr., he had nine receptions for 109 yards. So he's continued to look like himself after the injury he suffered last year. He looked good. He's still seeking that first touchdown catch of the year, but nonetheless, he looked really good. Um, again, he had 109 yards, so he did his part. Sterling Shepard who had a breakout game and very well needed a breakout game. The the past two games, he hasn't been getting that many touches or targets from Eli, and part of it is because of the offensive line's performance, poor performance. So he has six receptions for 80 yards, including one touchdown. So he's gotten his first touchdown of the season. And like I said, the offense looked really, really good. And hopefully going into a game against the, the New Orleans Saints, and they will be at home at MetLife Stadium, they gonna the, the Saints put up a lot of points. So the Giants, even though we, we can't predict what the score would be, one would think that it would be a high scoring game with these two explosive offenses. But going into to next week's game against the Saints, the Giants offensive line is clicking at the right time because they are going to need to put up points. Well also before I head and talk about the Jets, Evan Ingram, the, the New York Giants tight end, he suffered a sprained MCL. And he's considered week to week. And I've seen a report from Bleacher Report saying that he could possibly miss two to four weeks. So that's if he misses four weeks, that's a pretty big hit. Even although this New York Giants offense is already dynamic with Saquon Barkley and Odell Beckham Jr. and Sterling Shepard, Evan Ingram just makes it even more dynamic and creates a, a more of a problem for opposing teams' defenses to cover Odell, to cover Saquon and Sterling Shepard. He just opens up the field more. So they're going to miss him, and it looks like he is going to miss some time because the Giants did sign tight end Garrett Dickerson off their practice squad. So it looks like Evan Ingram may miss some time, but we'll see how the the Giants could, could sustain without Ingram. Even though he helps them, the Giants could, could still play well offensively as long as the offensive line does its job. I'm going to talk about the Jets and their disappointing loss to the Cleveland Browns who got their first win since the 2016-2017 season. And the reason why I say it's disappointing because the Jets were up 14-3 at halftime. And in the second quarter, it really it really turned around for the Cleveland Browns. It turned in their favor once Tyrod Taylor went down with, I believe, a head injury because he went into the concussion protocol. I didn't see the game, but he did go into the concussion protocol and as soon as he went down, Baker Mayfield, who was the backup, the number one overall pick in this past NFL draft, he came into the game. And you could, and from what I've heard, people were saying who watched the game said that you could just feel like a, a, a switch that changed for the Cleveland Browns, that it was a, a type of excitement and energy that they didn't have when Tyrod Taylor was on the field and has been on, on the field um, in the season this far. He came in, he threw for 201 yards, 7 for 23, zero touchdowns, zero interceptions. He did have one fumble, but it didn't result in a turnover. But he still, just him coming in the game, making accurate throws, doing the the necessary things that a quarterback needs to do and managing the game and protecting the football and, and, and just managing the game, he turned it around for the Cleveland Browns, and they came back to win, I believe, the, the, the New York Jets lost by, I think, a touchdown. I, I, I'll check, um, mention that 
in just a bit and check on check up on that real quick. But and, and on the other side of the of, of the football field, the Jets quarterback Sam Darnold, who was the third pick in the NFL draft, he has to play better. He was he went 15 for 31. So out of the 31 passes he made, he only completed 15. That is a little bit below 50 percent, which is very very bad. That's atrocious. He threw for 169 yards, no touchdowns, and two interceptions. So the incep- the interception topic for Sam Darnold continues, as it as you know as a rookie quarterback, defenses um, tend to to especially great defenses look to take advantage of of you being I'm talking about um, rookie quarterbacks. They take advantage of rookie quarterbacks who don't really know defensive systems well yet, and. So far, Sam Darnold, after having a pretty impressive first game of the season against the Detroit Lions, he has not looked good since then. He's had a, a total of five interceptions in the three games he's played thus far in the season. He started every game. So right now he has a three to five TD interception ratio, which is not good at all. And he's going to have to play better. And it's hit the Jets next game is going to be against the Jacksonville Jaguars on the road so it's going to be a big test for Sam Donald this upcoming Sunday when they play the, the the Jaguars to see if he can bounce back against one of the best defenses in the league so it's going to be a tough task for him and we'll see how he performs um but also about the score that I want to get to the Jets they lost well of course they lost they lost 17 to 21 so they lost by four points so they were up 14 three at halftime and didn't manage to put up more points to 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 pull this game off and now they're one and two and they are fourth in the afc east so although a lot of people including myself may not believe that the jets are going to make the playoffs you still want to win the games that that you go up ahead on they were 14 three again in the second quarter so they should have somehow pulled this game off but they didn't and they're going to have to bounce back against a very good Jacksonville Jaguars team that has beaten the New England Patriots and the Patriots although they haven't been playing well in the season the 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 dynasty they've established and having Tom Brady is still impressive that the Jaguars beat them in the way that they did so it'll be interesting to see how the Jets perform overall in that game and see if Sam Darnold plays better now, going on to the Mets, I want to talk about DeGrom and how he had another stellar pitching performance last night against the, who was it? The, the Atlanta Braves. The Mets did win three to nothing. And it very well, very well may be DeGrom's final start of the season. And he went out with a bang. He threw for eight innings, only allowed two hits, struck out 10. And he did, in striking out 10, he hit his 1,000th career strikeout, which is a major accomplishment for him and something that he expressed he wanted to do after in the post after the game in the post-game interview. So he finished, if this is his last game, he finished the season for 269 strikeouts. And anytime you get above 200, you're in one of those top elite pitcher statuses. And he's definitely been that, and he should win the Cy Young Award. Um... Also, he had no walks, so 10 strikeouts and no walks. He had a great game. He knocked down his ERA to 1.70, so it looks like he will finish the season leading the league in ERA. I believe it's impossible. Scherzer, who's the second pitcher behind him, his ERA is about 2.5 something. So it's from from my understanding, it's impossible that he would not um, finish the season leading the the at least the National League in ERA, which is a big. Um, part of the case of why he should be the National League Cy Young Award winner and he very well should be if DeGrom does not win the Cy Young Award for the National League then the award is a joke he's broken records he's broken records all over the place he's broken and one of the records he's broken was a 108 year record that was set in 1910 by I believe um, Leslie, Leslie King Cole I believe it. I believe he pitched for the Chicago Cubs with um, throwing, I believe it was 25 consecutive starts, um, allowing only three runs or fewer. And DeGrom has done more than that. I believe he's is up to 27 now. So he's continuing that record and 
he set the sing single season record for the major leagues. So it's although Max Scherzer and Nolan Ryan, the other candidates for the National League Cy Young Award, which is the most prestigious award a pitcher can get, a starting pitcher could get in, in, in baseball, although they've had great seasons, the Grom has been a historically great one. And for him to break all the records that he's breaking to to co consistently go out there knowing that this Mets team was not going to make the playoffs, that every time he went out, they barely gave him any run support. So with all that in his in the back of his head, he still went out there and performed, took it one pitch at a time and executed and was great nearly every game of the season. So he should be the NL Cy Young Award and with just two games, I believe two or three games remaining in the season, we'll see soon if um, Jacob DeGrom will win it. And I'll talk about that probably a little bit in next week, if not next week's show, in two weeks. Also, I want to talk about the captain is the captain of the New York Mets is back. Um, David Wright, the third baseman, he's going to be back after 851 days since his injury, um, so, uh, since his most recent game, rather. And he's been re he has been reactivated off the DL, and he's scheduled to play this Saturday alongside Jose Reyes, which is going to be interesting to see because they start off their careers together early. They start they basically start their careers off together in this Mets organization, so they're going to do it one last time, and that's a great way for David Wright to go out, who seems to be um, deciding that he's going to retire at the end of the year. But very quickly before we head into the break, I want to talk about the Yankees. And the NBA season, but I'll start with the Yankees. And they've locked up their position to make the playoffs. They've clinched a wild card berth um, actually four days ago this past Saturday after an extra inning win against the Orioles. So with four games left, they know that their opponent is going to be the Oakland A's. And home field is key for the Yankees. They're they're 53 and 28 at home. They play very well at home, and they'll have if, if they get home field. They have the crowd behind them. They, they like I said, they play very, very well at home, better than on the road, even though they have a 44 and 33 record on the road. They still have a better record at home. And if you're in any team playing a game that, that is only a wild card game in baseball is only one game. So it's win or go home. And you want it to be at home where you have the crowd behind your back and you're more comfortable. So in these four games left for the Yankees are going to be extremely crucial and I believe they're they play the the Boston Red Sox so I don't know if the Red Sox may rest their players because they already locked their um place in the in the playoffs and they're going to actually wait out to see who they're going to face between the the New York Yankees and the A's so it's going to be very important for the Yankees to get this home field advantage and to hopefully win three out of the next four games to, to solidify their spot of of possessing home field because they're two last time I checked last night they're two games above or ahead of rather the Oakland A's for home field but also very quickly I want to get up to talk about the NBA season and it starts in a few weeks again it starts in October 16th and this past Monday was media day and so I just want to talk about certain statements that um, superstars across the league said, and I'll start with Kyrie. He he said they asked him a question regarding whether he would stay in Boston, and he, he quote unquote said, "There are times where I think about having number eleven in the in the rafters. Hopefully one day that's the dream. So it looks like it, in order for him to get his jersey in the rafters, you obviously um, he most likely he would have to win a championship in order for that to happen. Usually." Players don't get their numbers retired in a in a in an arena if they don't win a championship for that team. So I don't know if he plans to win a championship this year, and hopefully he believe that gives him the case to have his number retired. But usually, when a player says that he wants to remain with that team long term, and there's been a lot of reports saying that he was headed to New York or possibly headed to New York to team up with Butler. But it's been a whole lot of other reports refuting that. So who knows what's going on? Who knows what's truly going in the head of Kyrie Irving? But right now with that statement, it appears that he's going to stay in Boston. LeBron James, he said that the Lakers have a long way to go until they can challenge the Warriors and contend with them, which I think is a, a realistic point of view to, to, to go from a lot of people, including Stephen A. Smith. 
of ESPN has him talking about blaspheming. He he's he's been blaspheming in my perspective, talking about that the, he believes the Lakers will go to the Western Conference Finals. And the way that the team is constructed as is, I do not see that happening at all. They simply just do not have enough talent to, to, to go around. Even though they have Kuzma, they have Lonzo, they have Ingram, and they've added all these veterans with Rondo and, and, and Stevenson and all these other players. Just the way that they're structured right now, LeBron's the only, he's the lone star on the team, and he's going to need more help in the Western Conference, the stacked Western Conference, to, to make the Western Conference Finals. Um, also, Klay Thompson, speaking of the Warriors, Klay Thompson, he said um, in regards to his free agency, his pending free agency, if he decides to go into free agency, he has one year remaining on his contract, I believe. He said when guys go into free agency, they're looking for situations like mine. So it seems like he's like Kyrie Irving. The tone that we're getting from him, Klay Thompson, it looks like he's going to remain with the Warriors no matter what. And he's content with being there. And lastly, I would like to talk about Kristaps Porzingis. And when the, the media asked him, what's the timetable for his return? He quote unquote said, it's hard to say uh, on whether he will miss the entire 2018-2019 season. So he also said there's no timetable yet that no um, 7-3 player has suffered an ACL injury. And he's right from my understanding and my research, no other 7-3 player or any seven footer rather has suffered an ACL injury from my understanding and my research. So he's going to take his time, which is something that's smart. He, he, you have to be prudent, not only him, but the Knicks organization has to be prudent with him to make sure that he comes back 110% and that he's first of all, medically cleared because you cannot let him come on the court if he's not medically cleared by your training staff. So it's important that they do not rush him back until a season that's pretty much useless for the Knicks in terms of making the playoffs. So they should take time, the New York Knicks. They should not rush him back, which Steve Mills has repeatedly said he will not do. He will not rush back Porzingis. So that's a good thing if you're a Knicks fan knowing that Porzingis, although it is concerning that he says hard to say, at the same time you do not want him to rush back into the season. But going to head into break, I'm going to be for the – for the past couple of weeks, I've been talking about getting back to the basics, um, the lessons that I've been doing. So today we're going to be talking about getting back to um, sanctification. And I'll talk about that more in depth after this break. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be a great lesson. So you don't want to miss it. So I'll be right back after this brief break. I want to go deeper in you, Lord. I 
Welcome back, everybody. That song was Higher by Kalante Gavin. And if you are just tuning in, you are listening to 99 on the line here on WBCR Radio. And I'm your host, Jonas Jackson. All right. So now <clears throat> to today's lesson is going to be about getting back to the basic sanctification experience. And like I've said before the break, the past few weeks, I've been or well, a couple weeks, I've been talking about getting back to the basics and the fundamentals of our Christian faith. You know, sometimes we could um, forget the fundamentals sometimes in our, our walk with God. Sometimes we could get distracted. And it's good to just touch upon the fundamental aspects and doctrines of our faith. So, again, today's lesson is getting back to sanctification. And the memory verse will be coming from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And it says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So the, the, lesson, the, the lesson aim for today is to review the basic tenets of the sanctification experience, including what it truly means to be sanctified. And um, a lot of people have basic misunderstandings of sanctification Many have made sanctification a denomination, but it is not a denomination. It is one of the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. And more than that, it is one of the foundational experiences of the Christian life. Regardless of your de de denominational affiliation, if you are a born again Christian, then you should be sanctified. Now, denomination is basically the, the, the titles that some churches have, like just like there's Kojic Church of God in Christ. Some churches have church of just Church of Christ or Church of God and Jehovah Witness. Those are denominations. But no matter what denomination you are in, if you are if you claim to be a born again, saved Christian, you should be sanctified. Sanctified is not denomination. It is a requirement that God desires from us as his as his followers. And I'll explain why in just a bit. So sanctification is a way of life. It is the way every Christian should live. Every Christian should live a saved and sanctified life. And unfortunately, many people don't know that or understand that. Many people don't even know what it means to be sanctified. And some people associate sanctification with a joyless life of severe restrictions and restraints. But this is not the case at all. True sanctification is separation. To be sanctified is to be separate. Now, um, the scripture that backs all this up, you can find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. And it reads and says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? And what concord have Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So here in this scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 17, the Bible tells us to be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers and the reason why it tells us not to be yoked with unbelievers is because the 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 places the people we surround ourselves eventually has an effect and influence our perspective and our beliefs so he goes on to talk about now he the bible goes on to talk about what communion have light with darkness so we got to know that as christians we have a, a we have different values, even though we live in the world, we are not of the world. And the values that we have, the doctrines that we follow are different from the world. So it is important as Christians that we make that distinction and remember not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And I'll talk about how it's important to not to know that it's um, necessary for us to be separate. But we have to be careful that we don't isolate. And I'll get to that in just a minute. 
So it also in this scripture, it talks about um, for we are the temple of the living God, as God has said, and, he, and God said he will dwell in them and walk in them and he will be their God and they shall be his people. And he's talking about the people of the light, the people that um, that are believers. So God can't dwell in us if we are, are living an unsaved life. We have to be to be uh, focused on the task at hand in our words, studying the word of God to know that what it truly means to be sanctified and to live a sanctified life. And part of living a sanctified life is being separate from the world, being separate from the materialistic things the to the and all the other aspects like jealousy like hate um like fornication having sex before marriage and things of that nature god does not accept that and god wants us to live a holy and upright life so he can bless us and the bible says that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him and in diligently seeking him reading the word fasting and prayer God would, would, would continue, as the song said, and um, by Kalante Gavin, to mold me, to, to bring me higher in you. And in order to get higher in God, we have to live a sanctified life. So sanctification is separation from the world and the things of the world. It is separation from the secular and the sinful. And this is not to be misconstrued as isolation. God does not want us to isolate ourselves, but he does want us to separate separate ourselves from people, places, and things that are not conducive to our spiritual growth and development. So, again, sanctification is separation from the world and the things of the world. And we know that in 1 John, I believe the second chapter, it tells us to, the scripture tells us to not love the world nor the things of the world. For the people that love the world and the things of the world, the love of God is not in them because God is not the uh god the like uh, the values that he has the 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 standard that he has rather is different from the world's the world has a different standard and, and paul talks about that about the laws and how he, he deals with he dealt with inner infliction inner infliction i'll talk about that in just a moment but sanctification is being separate from the world and the point thing to point out here also, like I said before, it's important that we be separate but not isolate ourselves from the world. We still have to go out into the world and preach the gospel to, to let people know of the good news of Jesus Christ and and, and to not try to, to like uh, some people tend to to isolate themselves, isolate themselves and not separate. And what I mean by that is they just turn everybody off. Like if you do this and that if like some of my friends curse and although and as christians this is an example even when your friends curse you should know as a christian and a saved person and if you're sanctified you should not be cursing as well because the bible tells us what to let no obscene thing comes out of our mouths and just like in instances like that even though we're going to be in certain environments that may be uncomfortable we still have to, to stand out and live right. As peculiar people, God has called us to live a certain way so that when we are in, in places of the dark, even though we don't fellowship with them, is the key word, fellowship. We don't, that's not our, our, our small circle that we put around ourselves because we know that the Bible says what? That bad company corrupts good character. So as, as the children who love the Lord, we want to be separate and I keep saying because it's important. We want to be separate but not isolated. Even though we don't do the things of the world, we know that we have to still go into the world to preach the gospel and to, to let people know what sanctification is and let them know that they have a choice. So in the salvation experience, you are saved from sin. You are forgiven of your sins and your sins are washed away. In the water baptismal experience, you become, you become dead to sin and you die to sin. You would think that these two basic experiences settle the sin question once and for all. But unfortunately, this is not the case. Sin is in the world and you live in a sinful world. We live in a sinful world. And plus, there is yet sin that is present in our mortal bodies or what the Bible calls our flesh. And, and this, this explains why saved, water baptized believers still experience inner conflicts and, and turmoil. 
It's not the way. It's not that they are unsaved and need to get saved all, all over again. Nor is it that they were baptized incorrectly and need to be baptized all over again. The reality is that the that the salvation and water baptismal experiences dealt with the sin problem at its core. It dealt with sin in your heart or in your spirit, but you still have to contend with it in your flesh. And the Apostle Paul does a thorough treatment of this in Romans chapter 7. And I'll quickly read that. Um, Romans chapter 7 verses 15 through 23. And it says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. So in this in this verse, verse 15, Paul is talking about how sometimes he doesn't understand what he does. That the things that he wants to do, like doing good, he doesn't do. But he he sees this pattern of human nature to, to do what is wrong. And that's why he, he goes on to describe it. But what I hate, that I do. So this flesh is enmity against God, is hostile towards God, is not friendly to God. And has his mind of his own. And Paul expresses his his um inner conflict with himself. And we all go through it. As Christians, we are not just all perfect and holy and upright all the time. It is not something. Being holy and being sanctified is a day-to-day -day process. It doesn't happen overnight. And Paul reminds the Romans and reminds us as, his, as Jesus Christ followers that... This flesh just has a tendency to do what is wrong, even when what you want to do is right. So we have to crucify self daily. And the Bible tells us, yes, that we have to crucify self daily. So it's a daily fight. In this lesson, it said to to we have to still contend with sin that is in our flesh. We still have to fight this human nature, this this second nature of doing what is wrong to sin and to, to to break God's laws. But part of being and getting back to being sanctified, that helps us to live a saved life and to live a consistently saved life. But going on to, to verse 16, it says, If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. And in the New International Version, it basically it says the same thing. It says, And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is is good and basically what i get out of that scripture is um says and if i do what i do not want to do i agree that the lord is good so he's basically saying if he if he continues to sin he agrees that that the um that the law is good basically saying that flesh like the law the or the the laws here on earth are different from god's law and his standards like you could you could drink after you're 21 but in the Bible, we know that you should know that it says to be sober and that wine is a mocker, even though it says a little bit of wine is good for the, the body or something like that. In the Bible, it does let us know to be sober and that wine is a mocker, which make, basically means that wine can make a fool out of yourselves if you drink too much. So in the 17th verse it says, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. For I know that that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. And the reason why I cannot carry it out, and some Christians can't carry it out, is because we haven't been sanctified yet. And, and that's why we sanctification is one of the cornerstones of being a Christian. Um, 19 says, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. So we have this this battle with this flesh with this with this mortal body that we live in we have a battle a, a daily battle to fight doing wrong and, and and doing what's not of god even though it might be right under the law and under the the eyes of the government and stuff like that we we have a spiritual standard by a spiritual father because he himself is holy and as his followers he requires to be holy as well um verse 20 goes on to say no 21 rather says so i find this law at work although i want to do good evil is right there with me for in my inner being i delight in god's law but i see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me so if we're not sanctified as christians 
we will fall into being prisoners of of sin. And we know that Jesus died on the cross that we may be freed from sin and forgiven of our sins by possessing the Holy Spirit. And I'll talk about that in next week's lesson. So if if you would be honest with yourself, you know that you have experienced the same thing, this inner conflict between your spirit and your flesh. And just like it reminds me of those cartoons when you have the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder, it's kind of like the same idea. So um, in your heart or your spirit, you want to do what's right. But in your flesh, you want to do what's wrong. And it seems as if there is a constant tug of war going on. And at times, the war is more intense than others. But it goes on. And sometimes you end up on the losing side of the battle. And sometimes you do the very thing you did not want to do. And at times, you, y you yield to temptation. At times, you mess up, you blow, and you sin. And that's why you need to be sanctified. That's why we need to be sanctified. Because all have, all have fallen short of the glory of God and sin. But it's important that in this life, if we want to live right, if we want to continue to live right, that we become sanctified. Because, again, this is a daily battle. And how do we become sanctified? We have to be in our word. We have to fast and pray. And also, the, 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 the main thing is we have to examine ourselves. Instead of critiquing other people in the church, instead of judging others in the church, we should be examining ourselves of the things that... Um, we know that God needs to purge our life, the things that we need to get delivered from. And we all have things we need to de get delivered from, including myself, um, whether it be bad thoughts, whether it be about um, fornication or whatever it is, lying, cheating, anything that it is. We all have our problems and things we need to be delivered from. And we have to be honest with ourselves that we have this inner conflict and, and acknowledge it and attack it and attack it by reading the word of God, by studying Studying, our, studying to show ourselves approval so we can we can be, um, it says faith come by hearing and hearing the word of God. So we can be empowered by an increase of faith to continue to be, to live sanctified. Because like Paul said, when we, as he wanted to do good, evil is always there. It's e evil is always present. So even when we want to do good, the, the opposite, the bad is always there. And we have to always make a conscious decision. In this battle against our, our flesh if we're going to live more in the spirit or we're going to live more in the flesh so um the nelson illustrated bible dictionary defines sanctification as the process of god's grace by which the believer is separated from sin and becomes dedicated to god's righteousness and this perfecting process results in purification from the guilt and power of sin and it actually results in in holiness and very quickly, I'm going to discuss some scriptures real quick before closing out. And this first scripture I want to get to is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. And it says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So living a sanctified life through the, the help of the Holy Ghost will help us to be blameless before God. In judgment day and he's chosen us as, as his followers from before the foundation of the world that we should live holy and in first peter chapter 1 verses 15 and 16 it says but as he which have called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for i am holy so we know that we serve a holy god we serve a righteous god and as his followers we should be living holy and having a sanctified life as well and hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 tells us why it says it says follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord so without holiness without living right and again it's all a process but without taking striving for the mastery striving to to live a sanctified life we will not see god if we're not living a, a holy and upright life and holiness, holiness is nothing to be scared of. Holiness is the character of God. And God is holy and he expects us to be holy. So I just wanted to encourage you on today to, to make sure that you're examining yourself. And one of the ministers at my church while I was teaching this lesson, he talked about how eagles um, in the spring, they go by the river and they examine the, the, the bad feathers that they have and they pluck them out. And as Christians, we have to do the same thing. We have to examine ourselves. 
Um, just like the Bible talks about how um, we try to take out the, the big beam in our brother or sister's eye. No, the smoke, the little thing out of our brother or sister's eye. So like the little problem that we see our brother or sister's going through, we try to to tell them about that. But we have in ourselves something that's even greater and bigger that we have to fix first. We have to start with ourselves first and examine ourselves first to 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 know what to pray about, to know what we need God to purge out of our lives and what we need to be delivered from. So I hope this lesson encourages your, your hearts. We want to, as Christians, go higher in the Lord. And in doing and to do that, we have to live a holy and sanctified life. And it's a struggle. Sometimes it's hard. A lot of times it's hard, as Paul said, dealing with this flesh and how it has its mind of its own to do the wrong thing while we want to do good. But if you continue to just be dedicated and committed to living for Christ, you will be all right. If you continue to read your word, prayer and fast. You will continue to, to live this sanctified life that God has called us to live. So until next week, I'll be talking about um, back to the basics of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So I hope you enjoyed today's lesson and the previous lessons. I hope you tune in for that next week at 11 a.m. So I hope you will have a great day. Be blessed. And until next week.